He's our next speaker. Um, he's a beef extension specialist at Cornell University in New York. And he will be speaking with you today about the value of symgenetics in um, to retail markets and has a case study that he'd like to share with us. Thank you, Laura. You know, being uh, later in the day can be a double-edged sword. Either previous speakers have covered all your topics and can sit back down, but unfortunately for you, uh, that's not been the case. And I hope that I can kind of blend in some of the uh, comments made this morning to show you a, a real-world example of, uh, of marketing efforts and farmers trying to work together to improve their product. So Dr. Gary Smith, who many of you should know, is a renowned uh, meat scientist, uh, been at Colorado State, now at Texas A&M. Uh, he listed 10, uh, uh, 10 opportunities for the beef industry, and the first one he listed was that we need to emphasize the systems approach to supply chain and prescriptive production. And so basically what he's saying is we need to be able to be more involved with the integrating of, of beef production from the cow calf all the way on out to the producer. And so what I'm going to review with you is a case study in New York where a small processor in southern New York uh, is attempting to do that. So what, how this all came about is about uh, three years ago this processor and I had worked together uh, for a number of years on his feeding program and, and his management program, he said, you know, I'm very frustrated. I only buy cattle from a few people, but the variation in quality is huge. And, and he sells all of his product through a retail store, so any variation has a big impact on his ultimate profitability. And so what we wanted to develop was a, a system where we could provide feedback to those uh, producers so that they could begin to man, uh, make management changes. And initially, we actually were going to try to set up a premium and discount system uh, to, to reward and incentivize uh, those changes. So what we wanted to do was to, to see if we could take basic carcass measurements and estimate retail value. And so, uh, as Dr. Jones mentioned this morning, uh, the difference between experiments at a research station and in the field uh, can be quite different. And, and this is not an experiment where I have a very controlled system, uh, the, the numbers are not balanced, but this is a real world situation and uh, I think it will still have some value to you. So in any event, this is uh, Wilson Beef Farms, is the name of uh, the business. They buy in cattle that weigh about 700 pounds. Uh, they go into a, a slatted floor barn. He finishes them and then runs them through uh, his retail outlet. But you can see what the diet is, corn silage, corn soybean deal. It's not a high rate of gain. Uh, he's looking for about two and a half to three pounds a day. And he kills four to six head a week. And the sla uh, slaughterhouse and packing plant are only about six miles apart. So the carcasses are killed for, for at least uh, uh, seven or 14 days before I collect the measurements. We collect the very basics. Uh, carcass weight, back fat, ribeye, marbling, and KPH. <coughs> then he takes two of those carcasses and one side from each gets processed into retail cuts, what he would put in his store. And it's the same cutting procedure every time because in reality, what he does, depending on what the demand is, if he needs more of one cut versus others, he'll cut the, the sides differently. But for the purposes of this work, he uh, cuts them exactly the same. Uh, using that uh, on about 100 uh, carcasses or 100 sides, we developed a regression equation to predict uh, using those variables, how carcass weight, we actually looked at all of the ones, uh, including marbling, and uh, uh, use them to predict the estimated uh, retail value. And he uses a consistent pricing mechanism, those prices have changed, as you might imagine, over time, as well as the price of feeder cattle. But for the purposes of this uh, presentation, I've kept everything constant. In the uh, uh, group of cattle, 
uh, that I'm reporting on today. Uh, there was uh, four sire breeds, Angus, Red Angus, Hereford, Sim Angus, and Simmental, and here's where it's not balanced. You see quite a bit of difference uh, in terms of the numbers, but this is what we had to work with. And this is the equation, which had an R squared of 82, which really, from a statistical standpoint of predicting, it, it is very good. And so what it says is, for every pound increase in hot carcass weight, we increase the value of the animal $3.34. For every inch uh, in back fat, and actually, as you know, there's generally not an inch difference in back fat, uh, it increased to 240, but if the tenth of an inch, it'd be 24. Ribeye area increases and KPH decreases. So we came up with a, a pretty good equation that we were happy with that was able to predict uh, uh, the, uh, the carcass value. So, no, uh, I don't know why that's coming up that way. That's all. Right. But in any event, no great uh, surprise here, except you have no idea what those uh, uh, mean. So you're going to have to trust me. <laughs> That's very strange. I looked at this how many times, and it uh, it's sitting there. But anyhow, so carcass weight makes up about 70% of the value difference. You know, we can provide all the premiums in the world we want to, but at, at the end of the day, it's still weight that really brings the most value. This uh, <coughs> this cell range percent age or percentage is uh, back fat, and it's about equal to ribeye area. So back fat and ribeye area are then followed uh, by a carcass weight. What isn't in this equation, and we ran, you know, this formal statistics to determine which variables were important, was marbling. And I need to explain why marbling did not come in and why that's important. It's been mentioned a couple times today. You have to know your market. Is that marbling really is a, uh, a proxy for flavor or for tenderness, right? And so commercially, that's the only way we have to measure that in a practical way. Well, what he actually does, he and his staff, his wife and those that cut for him, is they take a steak out of every carcass and they taste it. They cook it and taste it. If it gets tough, it goes back in the cooler for another seven days. And they'll take it back out, tough again, it goes back in the cooler. So he'll do that up to three times. And at that point, if they're still tough, then he makes sausage or uh, sticks or uh, hot dogs or whatever. So he's guaranteeing that his beef is tender by using, uh, by using a, a taste test. And so marbling is really not important to him at all uh, from that standpoint. Now, we, we do collect that marbling information, and we've done some statistics, and marbling is not related in this particular set of animals to tenderness. So, in any event, carcass weight uh, is, is the biggest driver. So, the next step was then to uh, figure out cost. So, we, we figured out the estimated value, but what's the cost to get them there? And this is, again, where we have a little bit of a challenge because it's a feed yard that provides cattle year-round. Well, as you know, if you feed cattle to the same extent, and we're still primarily a spring calving area, you have a whole bunch of cattle ready at one time of the year and not very many at the other. So he actually has two rations, one for a slower rate of gain in the, in the low twos, and one towards that three. So we can't, there's no practical way in this setting of keeping that straight. And so diet has, a, has a, uh, an influence on this information that we can't sort out. But we know the individual weight coming in, he uses a 60% dress, and we check that a number of times, and, and so that uh, holds pretty strong. We know the average daily gain in this particular data set. I've used a dollar forty-two uh, steer price for seven weights, and uh, I know if any, all of you would cringe at that price now. But when we started, that's what it was. Uh, feed cost to gain is a, a straight uh, value. Yardage is a straight value, and slaughter and processing. Uh, the slaughter is a straight value, and processing is per pound of carcass. So this is the data, and again, I'll go back to Dr. Jones. I told him at lunchtime, you know, we spend so much time putting our presentations together, putting all this data, and people, you know, uh, and he just did a really nice job of summarizing it. 
you know, you think after 30 years of extension, I'd learn something, but here's the data anyhow. So the fed steers, this is what the data look like. So we've got the English breeds uh, and the Simmental. Now just as a side note, I put the Sim Angus in the English breeds uh, because when I ran them separately, they behaved in all of the characteristics more like the English than they did the straight Simmentals. And so that is the way this data is run. So see the hot, these are the steers again. Hot carcass weight, I uh, put the P value there just to remind me that there was a tendency uh, for carcass weight to be heavier uh, for the Simmental. Back fat was lower, ribeye area was larger, no difference in KPH, yield grade as you might expect would be uh, lower or, or uh, uh, more preferred. No difference in the days on feed, no difference in the initial weight. Average daily gain was uh, slightly higher, only two tenths, but it was significant. Uh, cost of production, not significant. The estimated cutout by the equation was, uh, I don't know, if it's that four or three, uh, $200 difference. Uh, the net then was uh, about uh, what was that, uh, $90 to favor of the uh, Simmental cattle. And then I just put the actual observed uh, down here. And so even on those cattle where we did the actual cutouts, they were still significant. So the Simmental sired steers did as what was talked about this morning in terms of having a higher yield uh, and having more cutout. What was interesting though, and I didn't put the data up here, is there was no difference in marbling between the Angus cattle or the English cattle. Actually, there's no difference. I ran the, uh, there's a fairly large group of Angus uh, in this and I ran, ran the Angus compared to Simmental and there was no difference in marbling between those two groups either. So they were both a little choice uh, regardless of breed. Heifers, not so much. Uh, they behave pretty well equally uh, all the way through, with the exception of ribeye area and, uh, and uh, uh, back fat. So the heifers that didn't fall through, which may be the type of heifers that are getting sent to the feed yard, they're the ones that are too big that they didn't want to be retained, uh, who knows, but uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, tells us something about the animals. So the limitations of the dam, we don't know anything about the dams, or to go back and try to get that information would be very challenging, with the, except, with the exception of the Angus cattle, which are Angus on Angus, all of the other dams for the most part are crossbred dams. And they're crossbred, uh, some have uh, Sim Angus uh, in them, some are, are uh, predominantly English crosses, but there's a lot of variation in the dams. As I mentioned, the diet's quite different. Not quite different. Can, there's two levels of energy in each of the diets, so that's not practical to try to pull that out. Uh, my guess is, and I can run this yet, but I haven't done it. Uh, as was mentioned this morning, we're looking at indexes. We can predict the amount of feed that these cattle had to consume to get to the carcass composition that they ended up. So by knowing the energy value of the diet, the hot carcass weight, which gives you an estimate of the mature weight, which gives you the ability to uh, predict maintenance requirements, and then knowing uh, fat composition, so back fat, marbling, uh, <clears throat> we can predict uh, uh, how much feed they had to consume. And if I ran that, just knowing the differences that we saw earlier, my guess is the Simmental cattle, uh, uh, sire cattle are more feed efficient put that back into the total cost of production, and that value will be even better for the cinematal sired uh, calves. And then the endpoint varies. There's quite a bit of variation in the back fat from as low as one tenth to as much as we've had some over an inch. And so that's going to affect uh, the, the total cost of production that we have not been able to, to capture. But there's no denying, when we look at carcass weight, that uh, it is highly correlated to the profitability of these animals. And so the question becomes then, how do we uh, work with these producers to increase carcass weight, and if they're keeping heifers, to keep their heifers from getting too large, and then ultimately their cow herd from getting too large. So what I've done is gone back to some data that Dan Fox did quite a number of years ago uh, at Cornell. 
uh, looking at different production systems uh, and frame size or mature size. And so he broke up cattle into uh, medium size uh, frame scores and high, uh, uh, high let's say you on the high producing cow, larger frame size. And so as expected, all of the variables uh, are higher on those high frame cattle. Uh, from, from cow weight to uh, birth weight and so on and so forth. And these are centotol compared to Angus cows. And then he looked at a production system from data he had collected over time. And I'll just take a second to explain what these are. So we have the, the two types of production systems, the Angus sired calves, centotol sired calves. And then we had pasture management systems for intensive rotational grazing, which makes it, you don't understand what that is. And, and this is really isn't terribly intensive because these calves, are, the herd is moved about every three to five days. And then moderate rotation, where they were moved about every seven to 14 days. And then compared and looked at the continuous uh, intensive system, and that was continuous grazing, uh, but the, the pastures were fertilized and lined compared to unfertilized uh, continuous systems, so, or continuous grazing. So I want to look at that all across the board. Well, if you just jump down to the net farm income per cow, if on these high producing cows, if you're using intensive rotation, that's your highest uh, return. And the point is that in our system here in, in the Northeast in particular, uh, we have very good forage conditions, that's been mentioned. And so cow size is not as a big an issue as it is for us compared to the dry grass states that we heard about where they're eating green grass only two months out of the year. And so the concern about getting our cows too big is not as great as it might seem. And especially when you look at your um, genetic trends for mature weight over time on Simmental breed, they're not going up. And so I think that speaks well that we don't have to worry about getting the females too large initially uh, to meet this carcass uh, uh, premium, or not premium, but return when you're looking at the whole system. Because the last uh, slide is, is a very small data set, and I understand that, we can pick all kinds of holes. But what we did is we applied this profitability across the system. So we looked at the cow calf sector where we had intake data. We looked at their calves in the feedlot. And then we looked at their, uh, what they uh, got at the packer. And when you look at that whole system, as the cows got heavier, the profitability went up. So it kind of goes against what we always hear about, keep those cows small, which is true in certain market conditions. But when you're looking at the whole system, it changes what you need to think about in terms of cow size. But we can allow cows to get up in size to a certain extent. Now, granted, we don't want 2,000 pound cows. So there is a limit on all of this. But a 1,400 pound cow in our environment will, if it's a whole production system, is, it appears to be more profitable than a 1,400-pound cow, cow in, a, in a Montana system, for example. So again, it all depends on the market you're going to and, and where you're part of. But as the, Dr. Smith said, if we're looking at the whole integrated system of trying to be involved all the way through, it changes a little bit on your selection. The only last thing I want to, and, and, and this is the beauty or the disadvantage of PowerPoints, you know, it used to be you had to have slides. For those of you who care like mine, you remember that. You had to have that done, you know, at least two weeks prior to the presentation. Well, I was able to go back and change this this morning. Uh, because, and most of you understand this, but I just wanted to show how I use uh, EPDs for selection. To me, it simplifies things. And, and I wrote an article recently about forget the numbers, and which might seem heresy, but because there's so many numbers, it drives me nuts. And so I rely on percentile tables almost exclusively for anything I do. I don't worry about what the numbers are. And so the other thing I put in is some screenshots of how to get there, because each breed association 
it's not so friendly in how you get to the percentile tables. The centipal is not too bad because you can just go to the animal search, uh, which is there, and there may be a quicker way to do this, Jackie, but that's the way I figured it out. Then you go to animal search, and then go under data search, and it gives you percentile EPD averages. And then you click and you'll get this type of table depending on whether it's hybrid or purebred or fullbred. And so if I'm wanting to put selection pressure on a particular trait, and I know you're not to <coughs> use single trait selection, but for purposes of illustration, if I'm wanting to put selection pressure on a certain trait, then you just start up here with the first percentile and go down to the above 50%. And depending on how much pressure you want to put on, then you go lower, numerically lower, in terms of these percentile tables. And so, don't worry about the numbers per, per se. So if I want to increase API, I just say, well, I want to be in the 25th percentile, so therefore it's got to be above 137. And it just makes the whole EPB thing for me a lot simpler, especially in my case where I'm dealing with a lot of breeds as I work with with farmers across the board. So the question for all of you then, knowing that in this particular example, what do I tell the farmers that are working with this feedlot processor to put their emphasis? Should they use API? Or should they, knowing that carcass weight, back fat, and ribeye are the primary drivers, should we put pressure on those three, make sure they're in the 25th percentile? Obviously, cavities might be important. Uh, and a few other things. We don't want to lose any marbling, so you want to keep that at 50%. Or you just go straight to the API. That's a question, because I don't have a group that answer. So those of you that are much better geneticists, because I'm trained as a nutritionist. Yeah, Jackie. So the question is, what are the other three drivers? Because you said that you don't have any drivers. Yeah. Well, there's one for sure. But on our small herds, the terminal crossing is makes it a little more difficult. I mean, these guys, the small surface fed cows, so that's a little more practical than 25. But uh, still, yes, the exact right terminal is the best for sure. And then I go straight to the tall sire based on this day. I came here to learn something. Give me some ideas. Yes? How do you explain the difference between the sexes? The difference between the sexes? Well, you saw no difference on the heifers. How do you explain it? Because the types of heifers that are being sent to the feed yard, my guess is, are perhaps larger frame size to begin with. And, uh, for, and there's not much difference in, in the church size between the, the two. I don't know. That's the difference. In the equation, there was not an effect of sex. Right. But it showed up. But it showed up here. Yes, and that's the next step is to, uh, Dr. Jones asked about the, uh, the tenderness. And, and what, that's our next step to evaluate is tenderness of because uh, it's very frustrating for the processor because he'll go through weeks with no problems and then all of a sudden he'll have boom 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 a bunch of tough carcasses and so far we've not been able to relate that back to the farm it's only six miles from the feedlot so it should be a stress issue uh, so that and we haven't done we haven't got a strong correlation with marble so that, that's something we're trying to get sorted out because he certainly like because he loses a stake out of every carcass not to mention the shrink of going back in the cooler for another week how much success the other way how much success do you have when we back in how much success does he have with a week back in pretty good most of those that go back in for that second week come back out and they're fine now there's not too many that go back in for that third week Right, and if you go back to the uh, comment on the terminal, if you use the terminal cross system, and I think that would work really good, because then you could get your, your 
carcass weight that you need in a whole system uh, to be the most profitable. Because it's still, in the end, it's weight that makes the difference in, in terms of profitability. Yeah. I was just curious, could you talk about this endpoint? Mm -hmm. In other words, how are the animals selected for harvest? Eight. By your date, I'm guessing it's time on feed to some extent, or is it random? Now, what he does to the best of his ability, and again, realize that this is a retail market, but he has a relatively consistent demand every week of the year, he aims to slaughter cattle at half an inch. But if he's short, he'll pull them in sooner. If he gets a backlog, if he gets too much of a backlog, he actually go to the commodity market, which really hurts him. Uh, so, so that's why you see some of the variation uh, has to do with, with his demand and trying to stay up. So. And that obviously affects the profitability because we saw it's higher back fat animals are lower, uh, have a lower cutout. Yes, sir. But you actually believe there's going to be a correlation between marbling and tenderness? Uh, do I believe that? Uh, in the large data that, that's out there, yes. As you go up to quality grade, uh, unsatisfactory eating experience goes down. Uh, and so that's why quality grade is used as a proxy for eating experience or basically tenderness, also juiciness. Uh, but in this case, uh, it didn't come that way. Yes? I want your graph. Was the 1400 pound cow just the most profitable in the system, right? You know, the system? Uh, she was least profitable. Oops, sorry. She was least profitable and continuous, but also, but in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, continuous, you know, continuous grazing gets a bad rap, and the advantage of intentional rotational grazing has more to do with optimizing animals to acreage than it does to performance. And so, what this says. If you're going to continuously graze, adding inputs isn't going to do, the, do you that much good. So you've got to have them stocked right to, to use continuous graze. You just not have, have as many animals grazing. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to share.